Hello, everybody, and welcome to Food Integrity Now. I'm Carol Grave, and I'm the host of the show. I'm also a certified holistic nutritionist and a life coach, and I'm just thrilled to have on the show today Dr. Tom O'Brien. He's been on the show before, but we're having him back, and we're really excited to discuss his book. But before we get started, I'm going to tell you a little bit about him. He is an author of the national bestseller, The Autoimmune Fix, and is an internationally recognized speaker and writer on chronic disease and metabolic disorder. He's the founder of the DR.com, that's the doctor.com. He, spe he spearheaded the popular Gluten Summit and the docu-series Betrayal, The Autoimmune Disease Solution, They're Not Telling You. Dr. O'Brien has more than 30 years of experience as a functional medicine practitioner, and he is a faculty member of the Institute of Functional Medicine. Today, we're going to be talking with him about his new book, You Can Fix Your Brain, Just One Hour a Week to the Best Memory, Productivity, and Sleep You've Ever Had. Now, who doesn't need that? <laughs> this is fantastic. Okay, let's get started. Well, in uh, looking and reading through your book, um, you discuss in the very beginning how the brain works and how the autoimmune cascade can affect its function, and then you talk about different mechanisms that can affect your health. So uh, one of the first things to discuss, I think, is the health of your gut or your microbiome. We now understand that they're intimately connected. So let's start out, and if you could just explain to our listeners a little bit about autoimmunity and how autoimmune disease can affect the brain. Sure, you bet. Um, it was maybe 15, 18 years ago, there was a, present, a presenter in a conference who was talking about the microbiome. And we, we knew there was some bacteria in the gut, you know, and, but he was saying that um, there's 10, time more, 10 times more cells of bacteria in our gut than all the cells in your body put together. 10 times more cells. And there is 100 to 150 times more genes in that bacteria than in the human genome. And so as he's talking, I raised my hand and he saw me and he got a little smirk and he said, yes, doctor. And I said, wait a minute, did you just say there's 10 times more cells in the gut than in the bacteria of the gut than in the whole body? And he said, yes. I said, how is that possible? Just how, how is that possible? And he said, how many of you have that question? And almost everyone raised their hand. And he said, all of you are cowards. This was the only man that had enough courage to look like a fool and ask the question. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so that was a nice acknowledgement. But, you know, if you have a mile of oceanfront and you walk the beach, you walk a mile. But if you have a mile of oceanfront and then there's a little bay here and then it comes back and then another one and it comes back and another one and it comes back and you walk the beach, you now walk two miles in that one mile distance or some, some amount greater than a mile because you're walking along the beachfront, there's more beachfront. It's not just straight across. And that's what our body is like. Mrs. Patient, your intestines are a tube. It goes from the mouth to the other end. If you think of a donut, if you could stretch the donut out and look down the center of the donut, that's your intestines. So when you swallow food, it's in the tube. It's not in your body. It's got to go through the walls of the donut to get into the bloodstream and then get into your body. And so that whole mechanism of how that works is what our digestive system is all about. And uh, what happens is that the uh, uh, surface, the inside surface of the donut is lined with cheesecloth. That cheesecloth only lets really small molecules to get through into the bloodstream. I'm going to put all this together for you in a minute. Okay. <laughs> uh, uh, it's got to go through the cheesecloth, but only small molecules can get through. So 
our enzymes act like scissors to break down these proteins smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller until they're really tiny little particles of food called amino acids. And the amino acids go right through the cheesecloth to get into the bloodstream. And nothing can get through the cheesecloth until it's small enough to get through. It has to go further down and be snip, 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 snip by our enzymes. That's one of the reasons why we have 20 feet of intestines. It takes a whole lot longer to break down prime rib than it does a banana, right? And so it just takes a while. But what happens is we get tears in the cheesecloth. And if you get a tear in the cheesecloth, now these larger molecules get through the tears in the cheesecloth into the bloodstream. They're called macromolecules, big molecules. And your immune system says, whoa, what's this? This is not good for me. I better fight this. And you make antibodies to tomatoes or to banana or to chicken or whatever the molecules are that got through the tears in the cheesecloth before they were supposed to get through. When you make antibodies to those foods, now the antibodies are in the bloodstream looking for those macromolecules everywhere. There's something called molecular mimicry. And what happens is the antibodies that are looking for that food molecule, the, the protein signature it's looking for looks a whole lot like our own tissue. So depending on your genetics, the antibodies to tomato may start attacking your joints or it may start attacking the nerves in your eyes or it may start attacking your brain. That's called molecular mimicry and it's the antibodies to the food that now are attacking your own tissue and that's what autoimmune disease is, is when the immune system attacks our own tissue. Okay. So, so we, we've always thought that you, you want to suppress the immune system from doing that. And that's never, ever worked more than short term. There is very, very few cases of the millions of people who have taken steroids to suppress the immune system. Millions of, and you know, the drugs are good. If you need the drugs, you take them. But the goal is to eliminate the need for the drugs. And how do you eliminate the need for the drugs? You heal the tears in the cheesecloth, which is intestinal permeability or the leaky gut. Right. And you also mentioned in the book that there are four different immune systems. Can you, can you share just a little bit about that? The most potent immune system is the immune system in the gut. 70 to 75 percent of everything that's there to protect us is in the gut. And why is that? Because we have the same body as our ancestors thousands of years ago, exactly the same body. And so what did our ancestors have to fight? What did their immune systems have to fight? Bugs, parasites, viruses, molds, and fungus. That was it. There was no red dye number 32 or polysorbate 80. Or glyphosate. Or glyphosate or bisphenol A, BPA or mercury, or lead, uh, in the concentrations it works, there wasn't any of that. But our immune systems today are just like the immune system of our ancestors. We've not evolved into a more sophisticated immune system. So the vast majority of the insult that our ancestors may be exposed to, bugs, parasites, viruses, molds, and fungus, that was it. So 70% of the immune system is in the gut to protect you from bugs, parasites, viruses, molds, and fungus. The next immune system is in your bloodstream. That's the one that we've heard of called white blood cells, and there's five different types of white blood cells. And so if there's anything in the bloodstream that's a problem, then the white blood cells get in there and take over to try to protect you. The third immune system is in the liver. It's called the Kupfer cells. And the fourth immune system is in the brain, and they're called the glial cells. Now, of all four immune systems, the, the antibodies, for example, they're like high-powered rifles. They're special forces, the antibodies. They're trained to go after one thing and just one thing, and they're highly trained for that. Now, because of molecular mimicry, they may go after your own tissue, but they're highly trained. They've got high-powered rifles. 
But the glial cells in your brain, if anything gets through the blood-brain barrier into the brain, that's like a cheesecloth around the brain. If anything gets through the blood-brain barrier, the glial cells are standing sentries there, and they're usually really quiet. They're just on guard, but not, they're not doing anything. But if something gets through, these guys don't have high-powered rifles. They've got bazookas, and they just go to destroy whatever is trying to get into your brain. Not a problem at all, and thank God we've got that. However, if you've got tears in the blood-brain barrier, I call it B4, capital B number four, a breach of the blood-brain barrier. If you have a breach of the blood-brain barrier, that's leaky brain, if you will, for a slang term. If you've got leaky brain and molecules keep getting in, the glial cells are firing these bazookas to protect you, and the result is you get collateral damage. Now you start getting antibodies inside the brain to deal with the collateral damage. And now you have an autoimmune mechanism that begins in the brain. We know now, for example, that multiple sclerosis, and what is multiple sclerosis? This is patient, you take the wire from the battery of a car and it goes to the light, the headlight of the car. If you take the middle of that wire and you take off the insulation so the wire's exposed, and then you have that exposed wire touch the frame of the car, the lights flicker on and off. And you say, what's wrong with the lights? There's nothing wrong with the lights. They're not getting the juice. That's MS. Mm -hmm. So it's when your immune system is attacking your nerves that can get to be MS. And that's a very common mechanism of molecular mimicry when the immune system is attacking bacteria in the bloodstream. There's a number of papers on this. And because of molecular mimicry, the immune system is going after strep or it's going after Klebsiella, these bacteria. And as a result, if your genetic vulnerability is to this, you now start getting antibodies to strep attacking your myelin. And that's the saran wrap around your nerves and that's what causes MS. That's one of the mechanisms of MS. Interesting. Well, I know that inflammation uh, plays a big role. I mean, and we know inflammation in and of itself is not a bad thing, but ex I'm talking about excessive inflammation. Yes. So yes. how does that uh, excessive inflammation uh, affect the brain? And what are some of the mechanisms that create that? Oh, good question. Uh, the excessive inflammation in the bloodstream causes B4, a breach of the blood-brain barrier. So when you get a breach of the blood-brain barrier because there's inflammation in the bloodstream, then whatever's in the bloodstream can go through the breach of the blood-brain barrier and you activate the glial cells trying to protect you. So the question, so how do I reduce the inflammation? That's the million dollar question. And so you have to ask, what is triggering the inflammation? And then you start learning about anti-inflammatory lifestyles. I'll give you one example. We now know, and before we started here, oops, excuse me, before we started, you and I were talking a little about our mutual friend, Dr. Dale Bredesen. Yes. And Dr. Bredesen has identified that the most common mechanism of Alzheimer's, the most common mechanism is called inhalation Alzheimer's. It's what you're breathing. You know, back in the 1990s, every dog that they checked in Mexico City, every dog, when they died and they checked them, every dog had evidence of Alzheimer's. Every dog. Wow. In the mid-2000s, the urine tests became available. And so between the urine tests and blood tests towards the 2008, 2010, the research papers started coming out identifying the markers of inflammation in the brain and Alzheimer's, every child in Mexico City has evidence of the mechanisms of Alzheimer's. Every single child. That's now you think, you think about that for a minute. Yeah. What does that mean 10 years from now? And why? It's because it's what they're inhaling, that the air is so bad there that you breathe it in, it goes right through your lungs, into your bloodstream, straight up to the brain, causing a breach of the blood-brain barrier, getting into the brain, activating the glial cells, trying to protect you, so you attack this particulate matter, 
that's trying to get into the brain and you get all this inflammation in your brain. Then you get the collateral damage from the inflammation and your body's trying to get rid of the damaged cells of collateral damage. And that's the whole inflammatory cascade. Not so a problem if it happens once, not a problem. But it's every day. It's what you're breathing every day. Here's an example. Go to the car wash. Get a really nice car wash, you know, where these guys have the water bottles on their hip and they come over and they go, <laughs> you know, and they do your windshield and wipe it down. Nice car wash. Then drive home. Park outside your front door. Set a timer on your watch for four hours. Then go outside. Run your hand across the windshield of your car. That's what you're breathing every single day. You just can't see it, but you're breathing it every day. Inhalation Alzheimer's is the most common mechanism causing this rapid increase in Alzheimer's disease. Well, that begs the question, uh, you know, that's an environmental toxin, obviously. Right. So what do we do about it? We have to breathe. Well, here's, here's what you do. Have you ever pumped gas and you smell the gas while, while you're standing there? Yes. You're smelling benzene. Benzene is a neurotoxin. But you stand there just smelling the benzene. Oh my, you know, this will be done soon. You know, because it's not making me sick, it's fine. No, it's not fine. But what do you do? Well, you're standing downwind. Walk around to the other side of the hose. Now you're standing upwind. You don't smell it anymore. <laughs> we just have to start thinking like that. We have to start thinking about how to protect ourselves. And you get the best air filtration system that you can afford in your home. And where do you put it? If you can't get a whole house unit, then you buy the best that you can afford and you put it in the bedroom because that's where you spend the most time more than anywhere else. And so that's only a stopgap measure. That's like a Band-Aid because right. the air is still bad. Right. Now you write to your congressman. I'm not going to vote for you again until you vote to clean up the air. Right. And I'm going to make sure my dollars speak. And if they get 10,000 people that write that, they're going to start listening. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's stay on the subject of environmental toxins. What are some more toxins that, that affect the, the, the gut and the brain? And, um, and well, the most, the most common one is wheat. Um, every human gets intestinal permeability every time they eat wheat. The studies are very clear on that. Every human. It's just a question, do you, does your gut heal fast enough or not afterwards? Fastest growing cell. This is patient. Every cell in your body regenerates, every single cell. Some cells are really fast, like the inside lining of your guts every three to five days. Some cells are very slow, like bone cells, brain cells, but they all regenerate. So um, you, uh, everyone, when they eat wheat, they get tears in the cheesecloth of their gut. Everyone, every time, without exception. Just read the science. You don't have to believe, I don't care if you believe it or not. Just read the studies. Well, I feel fine when you, I eat it. Well, that means it hasn't torn you up enough yet to where you get the symptoms. But if you're going to wait until you're all torn up, then okay, we'll put that on your tombstone. He waited. When I'm, when I'm out and I, you know, I do not eat gluten and I'll, I'll say something to somebody, no, I don't eat gluten, no, thank you. And they'll go, do you have celiac? And I go, no, I just don't eat gluten. And they kind of roll their eyes sometimes like, Oh, it's just a fad. Right. Unfortunately, fad. you know, I'm, uh, uh, I'm chairing the uh, Celiac Society of India's uh, annual conference uh, in 2019. Oh, wonderful. And um, the title is International Symposium on Wheat-Related Disorders Beyond Celiac, Beyond the Gut. Great. Uh, world scientists coming in all, from all over the world. It's really great. great. Really great. great. We're, we're, we're really going to rock their world. Yeah, uh, And just talking about the science. So it doesn't matter what you believe. If you read the science, it's very clear that why doesn't everyone get sick when they eat wheat? Because they haven't lost oral tolerance yet. Uh, but more and more people at earlier ages are losing their threshold, are losing their tolerance because of all the other toxins we're exposed to all day, every day. And it's called loss of oral tolerance. You know, they did a study in, uh, at Mayo Clinic. This is really a fun study. 
uh, this was in uh, 2009, I think it was, they found 9,000 samples of Air Force personnel blood from the 1950s. And it was still good. You know, the tubes back then holding blood, the rubber tubes, you know, you, you freeze it to save the blood, but the rubber would decay within a year or two. Uh, and then the blood was no good anymore. But there was a leak apparently in the Freon equipment here, so it was much colder. So these rubber tubes didn't um, get destroyed and they stayed in their original shape. So the blood was still good, frozen inside. And if you're a geek, you just died and went to heaven when you find 9,000 blood samples from 50 or 60 years ago. There's no such thing anywhere in the world wow. where, where you, you would have access to that. So they were kids in the candy store. They're, oh, look at this. Oh, this is so great. Right? And so what did they find out? So these were all Air Force personnel from the early 1950s, and there weren't many women in the Air Force in the early 50s. Uh, so it was almost all men. And then they compared it with an equal number of men of the same age who went for physicals at Mayo Clinic in the last couple of years. So about 9,000, no, no, 13,000 healthy people. And they looked to see how many of these healthy people had the blood work that said that they may have celiac disease. And then they looked back from the young men in the 1950s, how many of them, their blood work says that they may have celiac disease. And they found that there was a fourfold increase, not 40%, not 10% or 100%, fourfold increase today of young men with the blood work that says, you got a problem with wheat here, you likely have celiac disease. Fourfold increase in 60 years. Yeah. That, that, was, that was the first, and this is long before glyphosate, long before GMO, long before that. And the other thing they found, because these people from the 1950s were veterans, and they followed their health history, how many of them had died in the next 60 years? Because those alive are now in their 80s and 90s. How many of them had died? What did they die of? And uh, Mayo Clinic knows the projections for young men today, if their blood work says they've got celiac, what their expected life expectancy is. So they know now, because there's more science available. And they found that guys back then lived almost fourfold longer, that these people had a almost, it was 380 some percent increased risk of dying early compared to the guys from the 1950 with the same kind of blood work. That's fascinating. Yeah, so what that shows us, and this is the big kahuna problem that both of my books are about. What that shows us, it's the accumulation of all the toxins that our bodies are, are just absorbing now never before in history that's making our immune system trying to protect us from this and this and this and this, trying to protect us all the time. It's called loss of oral tolerance. And, or just heavy toxic load. Right? Heavy toxic load, right. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Well, uh, in, in the book, it, you know, you, you offer so many um, little tidbits that the average person can do to kind of test their brain. I love yes. that part. So you had a list of questions um, that were indications that you may be having an issue with your brain. Can you just share a few of those with us and with our listeners? Well, you know, um, one of the things is, um, this article is available for everyone from the book. We, we give you the, to go back to our website to get this article. And this, this says a lot. Oh, the smell test. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And uh, this is from Scientific American. And I've got nine or ten articles like this. But what this tells us, if you do a simple smell test, it's like a scratch and sniff, like um, a lottery ticket. You scratch it off to see if you won or not. If you do a simple smell test, and if you don't um, recognize a number of the, the smells, um, that suggests that your brain is degenerating. It's wow. not a problem of your nose. 
It's a problem of the nerve fibers going back into the brain. And once again, inhalation, Alzheimer's. That when we breathe all this stuff in that causes inflammation in our bodies, the first place you get inflamed is the nerves carrying the scent back in, right? And so when you have um, uh, a smell test, and we give you the link in the book to go get your smell test done. It's simple. It's like 45 bucks or something. Go get this done. And this will just tell you, wow, do I really need to look at this? And if it comes back and it says that you got a problem, then you do the blood test looking for inflammation markers in the brain. Right. And if you have the inflammation markers in the brain, there's a blood test called the neural zoomer, as an example. There's 18 markers on that blood test. One of the markers, at last count that I checked, there's 246 different studies on the association of herpes, simplex one, the cold sores that people get, herpes simplex one, and Alzheimer's. And when they do biopsy of the plaque in the brain after someone passes, they find consistently there's elevated levels of antibodies to herpes. Hmm. And that it's your immune system trying to protect you from this virus overload that gets into your brain that triggers the production of the plaque. So in Alzheimer's, we think of this thing called beta amyloid and beta amyloid plaque. We've always thought beta amyloid's a bad guy. And the many pharmaceutical companies have done years of research trying to come up with a drug to get rid of beta amyloid. And I don't know if you know, but two major pharmaceutical companies in the last year and a half have closed down their Alzheimer's research departments and laid off the scientists. Yeah, they spent, spent billions and they're never gonna find an answer. Dr. Bredesen told us that and why? Because there's 36 different mechanisms that have to be fixed. One of them is, do you have elevated antibodies to your brain tissue or do you have elevated antibodies to bacteria or viruses triggering the production of beta amyloid? Yeah, and look how many people have herpes. Yeah. That is a fairly common one, and that's just one of the mechanisms. You also had a, a test in there, which um, I actually did, and um, I got a little concerned because I didn't do it very well, and that was the one where you um, stand and then hold your knee up for 10 seconds. I was kind of unbalanced in that one. That well, it's, really good. it's really good to identify that. It's not good to have it, but it's good to identify it because then it kind of wakes you up. Wow, something's going on. I need to research this a little bit further. Right. And what, what you would find out is that um, in my practice, I did a lot of research on this, and 68% um, of everyone that comes into our office has elevated antibodies to peptides of wheat. That if you do the right tests, 68% of everybody, doesn't matter what their complaints are when they come in. If they had elevated antibodies to wheat, 26% of them have elevated antibodies to their cerebellum. Mm. Now, it's the cerebellum that controls your balance. It's not your leg muscles. It's the area of the brain that sends a message down for balance. And this is why seniors have a hard time dancing up and down the stairs. It's not their leg muscles that's a problem, it's their cerebellum. So 26% of everyone that has sensitivity to wheat in our office had elevated antibodies to cerebellum. So what does it mean when you have elevated antibodies to cerebellum? You're killing off your cerebellum. So what do you do? You identify, first you do the neural zoomer test to identify the elevated antibodies to cerebellum. That's your starting point. Oh, look at this, this is not good. Oh man, this is not good. Okay, what do I do? Oh, okay, I have to get rid of the inflammation, get rid of the triggers that set this off. Okay, what are some of the foods that have molecular mimicry with cerebellum? Okay, it's wheat and spinach and rice and corn and soy, okay? So now I have to check spinach, wheat, rice, corn, soy. Do I have elevated antibodies to any of those? Is my immune system trying to protect me? If it is, get those foods out of there. 
And when you get those foods out of there, you recheck in six months, your cerebellar antibodies should have gone down to normal. And if so they, those ones you just mentioned are just the most common ones. Uh, right, and dairy. And, and dairy. Those, those are the most common. Well, I don't do any of those that you mentioned, so. Well, marvelous, marvelous. So then, uh, and if you, you may not have elevated antibodies to cerebellum anymore, that obviously you've changed your lifestyle in the last decade or whatever time it was. So maybe you've just got cerebellum that was degenerating off earlier and that you've had this balance thing for a while. Or, yeah. there's, or there's another trigger. It could be mercury, could be aluminum, could be lead in the brain. Those are all possibilities that can cause cerebellar degeneration. Also. Let's talk about mercury uh, for a minute because, uh, you know, I think that it's, it's – everywhere it's mercury vapor we're breathing it and you know a lot of people think of mercury they think of mercury in fish they think of mercury in amalgam fillings which are all issues but you know the vapor is an issue too yes um any exposure is an issue any so uh, what do we do about um too much mercury in our body well, you have to chelate it out. You have to first. You have to identify if it's there, and then if it is, then you apply the protocols to pull it out. Take the magnets to pull the heavy metals out, and then wait six months and check again to see. Okay, is it gone now? Now, do you like chelation or methylation, or what? What? What's, what do you like? I mean, if somebody comes to you and they have, you know, high mercury, what? What would you tell them to do? Uh, Good. So if they have elevated levels of heavy metals, say mercury, the question is, why do they have elevated levels of mercury? Do they have an ongoing exposure or is this just poor detoxification pathways and they're being exposed to a minor amount, but the body can't get rid of it. So it's accumulating. Mm -hmm. So you have to check the detox pathways. You have to check their methylation, as you referred to. Mm -hmm. You have to check their glutathione levels and see if glutathione's working properly. That's the master antioxidant that pulls um, metals out. Uh, so you, you, you have to look at the background to answer the question, why is right. this happening? Then um, uh, enhancing their detox pathways is beneficial to reduce the increase, but it's not gonna get this stuff out of there because it's very deep in your tissue. It's not right on the surface. Um, it's a most common reason why people have elevated antibodies called ANA antibodies, that's anti-nuclear antibodies. Uh, that's the nucleus of the cell, because that's where the mercury goes. It goes down deep into the cells and it hides out there. And so you aren't going to get rid of it at to any substantial degree by improving your methylation. You will, you will enhance the reduction of new mercury coming in. You enhance your body's ability to fight this stuff so it doesn't accumulate in your body, but what's there is already there. And you've got to get that out. And that's where uh, chelation protocols, detox protocols are so important. Yeah, and... Um yeah, the chelation method, you gotta, you got to kind of go slowly with that because you don't want to detox too quickly with heavy metals. Is that correct? That's very important. Um, I just came back. We spent four weeks at a world-famous clinic in Switzerland, and uh, I made an announcement to people who follow um, our work and said, you know, my wife and I are going to this clinic, and if you want to come over, you know, I'm not going to be teaching, but we'll be there every day answering questions and stuff. It's just a really great place. And it sold out in four hours. Oh, wow. So they, they'd ask if I'd come for another week. And so I was, okay, and that sold out. And then the third week sold out. And then the fourth week, and I said, that's enough. That's enough. <laughs> so we just spent a month there. And um, I found out that I had accumulated some more mercury. I thought I, I had gotten rid of all of it when I retested in the past, but I've accumulated more. And so I did uh, heavy metal detox and they don't mess around there. You know, the first thing you do there is, uh, the first week is to take care of your queen and they call it the queen and that's your liver. Mm. Because your liver is the master oil filter in your body. It filters everything right. that you're exposed to. And uh, so when your oil filter is dirty, you get dirty. You get dirty oil. You get dirty blood. 
you, you know, so you got to clean the oil filter. And so uh, the first week is for that. And then the second week was really aggressive, uh, safe, very safe, but chelation protocols uh, mm -hmm. un under heavy supervision to make sure. Uh, but it worked really well. Oh, wonderful. Wonderful. So, um, yeah, I know uh, I had a lot of dental work done um, before I knew any better years ago. And I actually had nine root canals done in one year because I had all these old amalgam fillings that were failing and stuff. And, and, and uh, uh, I think I had so much mercury in my body at that time that I created Lyme disease. And I share this with our listeners because I've healed it. You know, yes. I went through all the process and it, you can heal anything. Yes. And, um, but, you know, the heavy metals is something that, um, that people really perhaps don't think about. And maybe their mainstream doctor may not think about. No, they don't. And, you know, it's a very different world than it was 10 years ago. Yeah. Very different. And it's never going back to where it was 10 years ago. So you, you can't think like people thought 10 years ago. Yeah. Run your hand across the windshield of your cleanly washed car. And that's what you're breathing every day. And what is that? That's mercury that's coming from China and India. Uh, you've got no control over any of that stuff. Yeah. Uh, but that's what we're all breathing every single day. So let's talk a little bit about diet. And uh, I know that uh, you talk in the book about the ketogenic diet. And uh, I know several people that are doing the ketogenic diet, but I, I think it's, it's really great if you have inflammation and stuff. But uh, I, I know some people that are just planning on staying on it forever, which uh, I don't think is a good thing. I think you need to kind of cycle in and out of that. What's your take on that? The um, uh, ketogenic diet is an um, excellent, aggressive, therapeutic approach. Mm -hmm. But your ancestors did not eat a ketogenic diet. Yeah. Your body is not designed to live on a ketogenic diet. To use it as a therapeutic protocol, for some people, it helps tremendously. But here's the one thing that all of the authors of the benefits of the ketogenic diet don't talk about. And probably because I'm hoping it's because they just don't know this as opposed to they don't want to tell people. But uh, fats are absorbed in your body, in your intestines, in the tube. Fats are absorbed in between the cells not through the cells. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I said it backwards. They're absorbed through the cells, not in between the cells. Okay. Most foods are absorbed in between the cells. That, they're, they're called the tight junctions, and that's what leaky gut is, is when your tight junctions are stuck open. But fats are absorbed right through the cell, and that can be another type of leaky gut. It's called transcytosis right through the cell. But there's something called, uh, there, there's a really nasty condition in our culture today called sepsis. Yeah. And sepsis kills over 200,000 people a year in the U.S. When, uh, and usually it's seniors or people have been sick for a long time and they, they die of sepsis. It killed my mother. And Sepsis is the accumulation of bacterial crud throughout the body. That bacterial crud is called LPS, lipopolysaccharides. And that's produced in our guts uh, by bacteria, gram-negative bacteria. But it's not supposed to get into the bloodstream and get into the body. Not supposed to happen. A tiny little amount may be okay. It kind of primes our immune system, so we stay strong to fight LPS because there's a little that comes in once in a while. That's okay. But the way that LPS gets in the bloodstream, the, the most common way today is by leaky gut. All the different things we do that cause intestinal permeability allow the, these big molecules of LPS to get into the bloodstream. But the other very common way 
that LPS gets into the bloodstream is called lipid, meaning fat, raft, like up on top, like a boat, you're on the raft. So the fats, the LPS gets on the piggyback on the fat molecules, transcytosis, lipid raft transcytosis, right through the cells into the bloodstream. So fats are absorbed through the cells. But when you take a whole lot of fat, which is what ketosis is, and paleo is, a whole lot of fat in the diet, LPS piggybacks on the fat molecules going right through the walls of the intestine into the bloodstream. So you get higher LPS levels in your bloodstream. That's called endotoxemia. And that is the precursor to sepsis. And that kills over 200,000 people a year. So once um, these young people who are doing paleo and are doing keto because it trims them down, they look like Adonis, the guys, and the gals are babes, you know, tight little waists and all that. And they feel great how they look in the mirror, but they're not going to feel so great in five or 10 years when this LPS has been accumulating in their brain, in their thyroid, in their lungs, in their liver, doing this LPS triggering constant inflammation because now it's inside the body. So your immune system's trying to fight it. And that's a very common trigger for systemic inflammation when you're eating a clean diet. Yeah. So, so it's not so long-term. Anyone on keto, keto um, ketogenic diets or on paleo diets, you just need to check. Do I have elevated antibodies to LPS? If you do, stop. Stop so, now. And what tests do they get for that? I mean, is there a specific? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's called the wheat zoomer. It does a, a great job because it also is the most sensitive marker for intestinal permeability, not just for wheat sensitivity, but for intestinal permeability. And they've got antibodies to LPS there. And is that available on your site? Can people it find that there? Okay, it great. Is. That, that's, that's really wonderful information. And that's a really important topic that people just don't know about. Yeah. Well, I think Dr. Mercola, uh, he kind of used himself as a guinea pig, and he, he did the keto for a long period of time, and he realized, he tested himself, uh-uh, I can't continue on this. you got to cycle in and out of it. you got to eat those carbs, those healthy carbs, those sweet potatoes and, yeah. you know, and, and the good carbs. So. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I I just don't like any kind of um, absolutism in diets. Uh, I know one of the problems also with the paleo diet is people eat too much meat and or too much protein in general. And what happens when you eat too much protein? It depends. It depends on your genetics. It depends on your blood type. It depends on your microbiome. Yeah. And for some people, it's nasty. It triggers more inflammation, higher risk of cancers. There's a number of studies on high meat diets and increased risk of cancers. Now, there, now, we have to understand, though, the meats that those people are eating are garbage meats. They're not grass-fed organic cows. Or, oh, I see, I've only got 5% left on my battery, so I've got to go get my charger, so I'll, I'll be right back. <laughs> okay. Don't you love limes? <laughs> this is just such great information. I hope all you watching this are getting the most out of this because um, he's brilliant. Okay. Excuse me. Let me plug this in. Okay. We were talking beforehand about... Um, uh, uh, doing this video thing. And I said, you know, Facebook lives and stuff, you just be yourself and just, just try to share information. Oh my God, I'm about to lose you. I got to go get a charger. I'll be right back. <laughs> it's better than you just going away. <laughs> right, there you go. There you go. Okay. So um, a couple of other things I want to talk about. And then um, I want to kind of move into the second part of the book, which is, you know, how we create better health. We've kind of talked a lot about the problems, but one thing you talked about that uh, I don't think a lot of people are familiar with, and that's lectins. 
So uh, what are lectins and can you let us know how they affect the body? Lectins are a family of uh, carbohydrates and proteins that uh, many of us have a sensitivity to. And the lectin component of foods, they were designed um, uh, in wheat, the most common lectins in wheat are called um, wheat germ agglutinins. And they're designed to uh, uh, bind to uh, different tissues in the body. Uh, and in a wheat plant, when insects eat the plant, the lectins bind inside their gut and, call, and the immune system goes after those lectins and it causes intestinal permeability and the insect dies. So it's a safety mechanism that uh, unfortunately in today's world, lectins in um, uh, spinach, tomato, corn, and uh, soy uh, can cause uh, uh, antibodies in your eyes. The, the uh, uh, cells are called aquaporin, and if you make aquaporin antibodies because you have a lectin sensitivity to spinach, you, you can go blind, or you, you can have some pretty severe uh, uh, eye vision problems. In the Far East, one-third of all of the uh, neurodegenerative diseases come from aquaporin antibodies, the disease is called neuromyelitis optica. And it's a reaction to spinach, corn, soy, or tomato. And it's the, the component of those foods that your body makes antibodies to, but then it can go after your eyes. Um, we know that, and on my site, my, my website's thedr.com, thedoctor.com. And uh, a friend of mine, Sire G, who runs Green Med Info, great, great site. Yeah, that is a great site. Uh, Sire put something together called The Dark Side of Wheat. And it's a little PDF that you can download. And he gave it to us to say, just give it to everybody. I said, well, that's very kind of you, man. So it's free. And there's 350, I think it is, articles about the lectins in wheat and all the different damage, including uh, miscarriages uh, or menstrual problems that can occur, brain dysfunction, attention deficit. There are so many different conditions because these lectin molecules can bind onto almost any tissue in your body. Then your immune system goes after those, those bugs that are grabbing onto your tissue. And that they're not bugs, but the immune system, once again, um, bug, parasite, virus, mold, fungus. Your immune system can, o can only respond as if it's one of those five. And so when lectins bind onto your muscle cells, you start making antibodies to your muscles. And, or to your kidney cells, you make antibodies to your kidneys. Or to your aquaporin cells, you make antibodies to aquaporin. It, just, it doesn't matter what tissue it is, the mechanism is the same. And we go through that a lot in the book, The Autoimmune Fix. So my, my platform belief is that people need to understand the basics of OMG, this is really not good. And when they understand the basics of it, then they're motivated to learn, how do I really nail this thing? How do I really take care of it? Because if they don't understand the basics that this is going to kill you, if they don't understand that, then they just look for a fix so they feel better. Yeah. And, and we can't live our lives that way anymore. It's not working. Yeah, yeah. Well, this kind of uh, brings us to the next part and part two of the book, you know, about creating better health. Uh, you recommend going to a functional medicine doctor who can give you a checkup that's going to be if you if you've never been to a functional medicine doctor it, it's going to be way different than your average gp yes and so what might that look like going to a functional medicine doctor just well, well people can get a sense of it and they're welcome to do this and then take it with them when they go find a functional medicine doctor you go to my site the dr.com forward slash living matrix and you fill out the questionnaire, the Living Matrix questionnaire, 
is tremendous. And we recommend all doctors use it in their practice. That it'll take you two or three days to fill out this questionnaire. Because I want to know, what was your mother's pregnancy like with you? Was she on any medications? Was she stressed? Uh, was she a smoker? What, what was the pregnancy like? And how was the birth? Was it a natural childbirth or a C-section? And were you breastfed? Because if you weren't breastfed and you were a C-section baby, then your gut got initially inoculated with the bacteria in the operating room or the birthing room. Your gut was not inoculated with the microbiome of mom, which is what the most important aspect of natural childbirth is for the baby, is they get all this good bacteria that passes on the genetics of your family, that mom passes on the genetics through the microbiome, not just through the egg that gets fertilized, but the microbiome is the, uh, it's, it, it's kind of like your DNA is the blueprint, but the microbiome is all of the workers that build the house, you know, the, it, and, and the general contractor, and the plumber, and the carpenters, and the plasterers, and the tile layers, and the brick layers, and the electricians, and um, that's the microbiome. So if you unfortunately were not able to be natural childbirth, and come down the canal of mom and get covered in all that slop, that goop, which is just the best thing in the world. For, there's nothing better for baby. And many, many ob now, if they have to do a C-section, if it's emergency and they have to do it, you do it, of course. But they'll take a sponge and they go up inside mom's birth canal and they just wipe the baby with that sponge to give baby as much of that bacteria as possible. Yeah. Because that bacteria, here's how, it's, it's pretty cool. You know, <clears throat> in the, usually there's not much Prevotella, that's a type of bacteria, in the vaginal tract of moms. Kind of hard to identify, there's not much at all. But in the last month or so of pregnancy, it becomes dominant. Prevotella is just the most dominant bacteria. Why? Because when baby comes down the birth canal, Prevotella gets in baby's eyes and nose and mouth and ears, <clears throat> gets down in the gut, and it says, okay, baby, here's the code of the milk that's about to be the food that's going to keep you alive. You know, so here's the mammal's code for the milk. This is a secret code, you know, and this is the food that you're about to get. So get those digestive enzymes starting to work to prepare for that, that food that's coming in. That's what Prevotella does, one of the things that it does. The baby's born and baby's ready, now it goes right to the breast, and then he, the first three days of milk is not milk, it's colostrum. And colostrum turns the genes on for baby This is okay, baby, time to close those tight junctions because every baby has severe intestinal permeability when they're in the fetus. Every baby in the womb um, is severely intestinally permeable. It's normal. It's how it's supposed to be. But the colostrum turns the genes on to close the tight junctions. That's why colostrum is one of the things we recommend for people with leaky gut, because it turns the genes on to close the tight junctions. Yeah. Right? And so baby has been prepped for life when co baby comes down the birth canal and then gets colostrum to, to begin life with. So why do I want to know about your birth? Because this is why. Because if you didn't get this, you know, for whatever reason, if you couldn't get this, then you've got a gut that most likely, and then the common history for these people is that they had ear infections when they were infants and young kids. They've had 8, 10, 15 prescriptions for antibiotics by the time they're 10 years old, and antibiotics wipe out the good guys in your gut. And then in their teenage years, they've got acne. And some of these women, they have uh, irregular uh, cycles. When their periods begin, they're quite irregular. And they get all this acne. Then they start getting irritable bowel and cramping and stuff in their late teens and early 20s. And then they um, still have acne, and they're doing the meds for the acne to try to cover it up. But it's not a problem of a med deficiency. 
causing the acne, right? right. And, and so they keep doing this, and then they come to you, and they've been diagnosed with inflammatory bowel disease. You know, their gut's on fire. And so you're, you're going to treat them at 34 when they come in for inflammatory bowel disease. No. You, of course, treat the symptoms so they feel better, but you got to go back and rebuild the gut. You have to check and see if the gut's out of balance, if it doesn't have the right diversity, and then create building a new diversity. So this person can have a lifetime of health in front of them and not be dependent on drugs for the rest of their life, trying to keep their symptoms under control. Yeah. So when, when you go to a functional medicine practitioner, the first thing is the history. And the more comprehensive you are in giving that information over, and most docs don't have time to ask these questions. Sorry, I've got something in my eye. Okay. Most docs don't have time to ask all these questions. That's why the living matrix is so great. And you, you, you can do it on my website. So you do the whole thing, then just download it, keep it in the file, do it for every person in your family, for your kids. And so you've got living matrices for everyone. So if anyone has a problem in their lives, you can just take this out of the file and say, here's my child's history. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, that's a great resource. Thanks for sharing that. Uh, you know, I can't leave you without talking about a subject that is near and dear to me, and um, that is uh, the elimination of GMOs and chemicals, in particular Roundup glyphosate from your body. Uh, I just was at the National Heirloom Expo in Northern California, and I, I did a, a, a panel discussion with Dr. Don Huber, and Dr. Michelle Perro and Jeffrey Smith was in the audience and Zen Honeycutt of uh, Moms Across America. And it was just a wonderful resource uh, talk for what's making our kids sick. And obviously we talked about glyphosate more than anything. So uh, it's really important, isn't it? Yes, it is. Uh it is. It's really important. There are so many studies now that show a correlation that uh, it's not good for you. It makes you sick. I remember I saw an interview with a scientist from Monsanto who was saying how safe glyphosate was. He says, matter of fact, you can drink it. Oh, yeah. I said safe. I saw that too. And, and the interview goes, well, you know, we just happened to, and he reached behind him and he had a gallon of glyphosate. He said, may I pour you a glass? And the guy said, I'm out of here. This interview's over. Right? So, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, it's it's critically important. Yeah. It, remember, it's loss of oral tolerance. Glyphosate is just become a more common um, uh, target because it's so prevalent now, but it's not more powerful than mercury or than lead poisoning. They're all bad. They're all bad, but glyphosate is one that's easier to deal with for us because we can eat organic and, right. and demand that your local supermarket, every time you go in, you just take, it'll take you three to five minutes to ask for the produce supervisor, the produce manager. Hi, do you have organic yams? Uh, uh, no, well, why not? Oh, well, um, I'll look at that. <laughs> and, you know, if we have 50 people a week that are asking questions like that, it won't take them long because if you build it, he will come. If you ask, they will carry it, right? Because they'll make a profit selling it to you. Right. And there's exciting news out uh, recently about apple cider vinegar, kombucha, and um, sauerkraut. They all have a component in there called the Cetobacters. And Dr. Stephanie Senoff did some research on that. And she has found that this Acetobacter dissolves glyphosate. So how easy is it to incorporate those into your diet? Well, I recommend to every patient that they get five different types of fermented vegetables uh, at the store, sauerkraut, kimchi, miso, fermented beets, uh, curry flavor, and every day you have a forkful of a different family. Yeah. One, re one reason for that is that you're inoculating with different strains of good bacteria every day because the key to a healthy gut is diversity. Right. But the second reason is because uh, you increase acetobacter. 
mm -hmm. which can break down glyphosate. Yeah. And I don't mean to minimize glyphosate. I want to make sure that people are clear. I'm not minimizing the damage that occurs from that. It's really important. It's really important. But it's one piece of the picture. And that's one that, uh, you know, my book, the subtitle of the book is One Hour a Week to the Best Memory, Productivity, and Sleep You've Ever Had. And so this week, I'm going to learn how do I increase acetobacter for me and my family. And they say, oh, good. All right, I'm going to buy these things at the supermarket, organic. And then it's done. Then for the rest of your life, you know, it's done. You've done it. Next week, okay, what am I going to do to reduce the mercury exposure for me and my family? And then you learn about air filtration systems, and you get an air filtration system. Boom, it's done. Do you have a recommendation on an air filtration system? I mean, a type. It doesn't have to be a brand, but a type. It all, all depends on your resources, um, how much you can spend. The ideal is a whole house unit that hooks up to your furnace or your air conditioning system. Uh, if you have a central heating or cooling going on all day long, you want an air filtration system in there. If you don't have central heating or cooling, then um, standalone units um, in the rooms where you spend most of the time. Okay, and you mentioned the bedroom, obviously, because we spend a lot of time in there. So that's great information. And do you have any recommendations, um, just kind of general, on uh, a patient comes to see you and they're not taking any supplements? Uh, what would you recommend that they take? Ah, good question. Uh, three things, four things. First, organic food. That's the best supplement that you can take. I agree. <laughs> or organic food, nothing better, nothing better. After that, um, a most common problem that people have is intestinal permeability or the leaky gut. And what you learn in the book is when you have a leaky gut, you also have a leaky brain. So the nutrients that help to heal a leaky gut also help to heal a leaky brain. And um, uh, we put together on my site, you know, there are many places you can go, but there, there are many nutrients. I, th I thought I might have one in my pocket, but I don't. There are many nutrients that have been shown to be beneficial to heal um, a leaky gut. There are many. And some doctors will say, well, I give glutamine to heal intestinal permeability. And they'll just stand there like that. And I'll say, well, that's great, doc, that's really great. But glutamine doesn't turn the genes on to heal that vitamin D does. Right. And vitamin D doesn't turn the genes on to heal that turmeric does. And turmeric doesn't turn the genes on to heal that fish oils do. So we put together these packs and there's 22 nutrients in the pack and every single one of them activates different genes to heal intestinal permeability and rebuild a healthier gut. And they're called gluten sensitivity packs. Oh, nice. Mrs. Patient, can you take one pack a day? Just one pack. It's six pills in there, but it's one pack. Can you take one pack a day? Yeah, I can take. Okay, good. Take one pack a day. And so that's because it's so important to heal intestinal permeability. And uh, along with that, um, colostrum. Uh, and there's a, the colostrum that's on our site is the exact same product that's licensed by three countries in Africa as the treatment of choice that the government pays for if you're diagnosed with HIV. Wow. This is the colostrum because it heals the gut, turns the genes on to rebuild a healthy microbiome that helps you fight this virus. And it's very effective, it's great. And it's called uh, uh, GS Immuno Restore. Uh, it restores the immune system in your gut. So those two things are my basic go-tos. Uh, with a focus to heal the gut. Organic foods, lots of variety of vegetables in there, and then those two basic things. Great. Thanks for sharing that. Well, you know, the book just had so much wonderful information. We covered a very small amount of it, but what I really enjoyed about it, it it's somewhat of a how-to book. You, uh, know, yeah. you know, how you take this step, and then if there's a problem there, here's your next step. And it's, it's really written for the layperson to help them understand that they might have this issue or they might have that issue 
and then what they can do about it. So uh, again, it's you can fix your brain just one hour a week to the best memory, productivity, and sleep. And I will put a link to this, uh, how you can get the book below the video. Also, uh, Dr. O'Brien would like to offer a free resource to you that includes um, Dr. Tom's Pantry Essentials, Anti-Inflammatory and Brain Boosting Staples. And I'll put that link below too, so people can go there and, and get that. And that's just a wonderful resource. No. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you for that. My, uh, my staff sent me this this morning. That's what well, I was just looking for. Currently, it's ranked number one in memory improvement, number one in Alzheimer's, number one in immune system, number one in neurology, number one in strokes, number one in sleep disorders, number one in nervous system diseases, number one in memory improvement self-help, and number one in dementia. Excellent. Uh, that's really great. I, I'm really congratulations. Really that's that's I, fantastic. Well, you know, I I just love that the information is evolving so quickly. Yes. You know, about all these neurological diseases that you know are just devastating. You know, yeah. if most of us have known somebody that you know has Alzheimer's or you know somebody maybe that's died from Alzheimer's, it, it's it's. It's not a fun way to go. So, no, and um, these diseases take 20, 30, 40 years of developing. That's why the smell test is so important because it's a wake up, you got a problem here. And what, you know, if you don't pass the smell test, a simple 50 buck test, if you don't smell, pass the smell test, then you know that, um, then, then you know, boy, I need to do something about this. I need to learn a little more about this. Right. And, and you, you can rebuild. You can fix your brain. Yeah, and then, then you offer that information. If, 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 if this, you find out you, you have a smell issue, then you offer what the next step is. And, right. uh, again, the website is the doctor.com. That's the dr.com. And it, there's a ton of information on there. And so... Um, really comprehensive. So thank you, Dr. O'Brien, for being a guest again on the show. And um, I look forward to perhaps meeting you in person one of these days. So. Thank you, Carol. It's really a pleasure to be with you. And you know, it's so empowering to see uh, people in um, our senior years, you know, you, you and I, yeah. uh, uh, knowing as much as we know, and it comes from necessity at some point, right? But knowing as much as we know and enhancing the quality of our health. And hopefully we can pass this on to the next generation. Yeah, um, I just have to uh, end with some, I'm on the board of uh, Moms Across America, which is an excellent organization. And um, Zen Honeycutt is the, the founder of it. And she was sharing with us yesterday that she was with a group of scientists and she and some other moms were explaining something and the scientist looked over, I think he was from another country, and he said, wow, moms are becoming scientists. <laughs> and, you know, it's true. You kind of have to be these days. Out of necessity. Out of necessity. You can't just, you know, go to your doctor and believe everything they say. You've got to do your own research. That's right. And that's what these books are designed for, is to give you a heads up and give you um, uh, guidance on what kind of questions to ask and where yeah, to learn. Absolutely. So thank you again, and thanks to our listeners. Uh, you can also subscribe to us on YouTube, Food Integrity Now, or of course on Facebook. And uh, we'll be back soon with another great show. So thanks for being here.